Thanks to both for this great opportunity. As uh, uh, was said, Subodh and I share a long past, and I think used to be mostly drawing cartoons in class <laughs> rather than listening to lectures. <laughs> so this is, as I sent out a message, my favorite topic. So uh, usually I do it like a three and a half hour workshop. So after one hour, if I'm still talking, you're welcome to gag me and bind me and carry me out kicking and screaming. Okay, so. Just remind me when it's 12.30. So um, childhood sexuality, why are we talking about it today? Um, my main kind of interest in this area is because I work with children, with parents, with teachers, and more and more in my experience, I realize that um, this is something we need to talk about if we are part of any child's development, because it's an extremely important part of child development. And it's such fun, it's such a wonderful part of child development. But most people are scared of it, so it remains at the fringes. So my hope is to make childhood sexuality more and more mainstream. And uh, not only like neurotypical kids, but the sexuality of children with special needs. And of course, they'll grow into adults with special needs. But today, we'll be focusing on um, you know, neurotypical kids mostly. Also, the other thing I'd like to say is that um, as I said, this is you know, a topic that so much can be said and spoken about. So I will not really go too much into detail, but maybe at the time of questions, if someone wants a specific, like how do you tell a child about X, then we will you know, have time for that, okay? But I'm just going to kind of give an overview, and I hope I do justice to this wonderfully complex uh, yet fascinating topic. Uh, I th is, you're doing it? <coughs> Thanks. Okay, so... Uh, Right? Yeah, so I believe that sexuality is a gift that all of us share, whether we are adult, you know, children, male, female, transgender, whatever. And it starts right even before birth, right from conception, I would say, and it never loses its significance. We are always going to be sexual beings. Now, I'd like to distinguish between facts and opinions. So, facts are universal, whether you're sitting here or in Timbuktu you know, uh, ovum and a sperm join together to create a baby, okay? That's, that's universal. But whether you believe, uh, you know, should people get married and only then have babies or should uh, gay couples be allowed to have children, that's an opinion, okay? And we are not going to argue about opinions and values today. I believe values belong to families and the families have a right to give values. And many parents are afraid, you know, if we tell children about sexuality and the facts, you know, are they going to then, you know, want to go out and have sex or are they going to kind of, uh, you know, like our values, are they going to ruin them? And I always say this, professionals like me can only give facts. We can give information, right? But the value, giving the value belongs to the family and therefore families must be a very important part of sexuality education. Many parents say, oh, we can't do it. Let's send this person to the doctor in the school, let the teacher talk to the child. And that's not enough because children actually value their parents giving them values and talking about uh, sexuality. Okay, so let's, before we talk to our kids, let's talk among ourselves. So I'm going to pose you all a question and I want to hear uh, what you think. So my first question is, at what age do you think children should receive sexuality education? Anybody? How many parents do we have here? If you could just raise your hands. Okay, roughly about half. Teachers? Okay. Grandparents? Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so at what age? Yes. Around eight years old. Okay, so uh, eight, how many people agree with eight? Okay, more. That you, anybody feels that's too young? Maybe we should go a little like. Okay, maybe a little later. I think it also depends how much detail you go into. Okay. You start to plant the seed as soon as the children ask questions about it. Okay. But maybe save some of the granular detail for when they're like nine or ten, maybe. Okay, so just wait for them to ask questions. Is that what you're saying, or I just think if as questions they... come up, I think you shouldn't brush it to the side. You should yes. Answer it, but yes. The detail you give should. Right, how not like, that's not a question. You shouldn't be asking these questions, yeah. right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> right, okay, younger than eight? Yeah. Okay, how young? How young would you go? 
Five, 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 five or six. Five or six. Five or six. Five or six. Little bit. Little bit. I mean, yes. They know a little bit about their bodies. They're curious. As yes. When they start talking and all. Yes. I think it's the right time. Okay. So two, one, two. Two, two, two and a half. I mean, when they start okay. like displaying a curiosity. Absolutely. They might not understand, but in their language. Yes, yes. Okay, so as I said, sexuality starts from conception. So actually, sexuality education starts from birth, right? And as you said, you know, children are curious about their bodies and they fondle themselves and they ask questions quite often. So we should be ready for that. Question number two Does sex education increase promiscuity or sexual experimentation no. behaviors? No. 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 Anyone thinks yes? <laughs> okay, and the no came very fierce. No one's going to say yes. <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a lot of research that has shown that lack of sexuality education actually promotes experimentation and unsafe behavior and so on. Okay, so no one should have any doubt in your minds that talking to children about sexuality, any aspect of it, their bodies or how babies are made or about contraception or you know, whatever, yeah, it's not going to increase their exploration or their experimentation, but lack of knowledge does. Right, so the case for an early start, uh, as I said, it starts right from birth. First of all, kids are growing up faster than ever before, right? I'm sure, you know, those of you who have kids in this generation, what do you think? Are your kids smarter than you when you were their age? Much more. and they're you know, 10 steps ahead of us. So we really have to keep up with their knowledge and sometimes they'll ask us questions that we don't know the answers to. So we'll see what we can do about that. Uh, girls are maturing earlier. Okay, and there are many, many reasons for this. Um, one of the things is that, you know, with obesity and now childhood obesity is increasing, okay, like at a, the highest rate, we have an epidemic in fact of childhood uh, obesity. So that tends to push maturity faster, right? So uh, then there are a lot of the, uh, what they call uh, endocrine disruptors, which are actually chemicals, which sometimes they occur naturally in nature, or they can be byproducts of like plastic, but these really play havoc with our endocrine systems. So you'll see there's a huge increase even in endocrine cancers, whether it's testicular cancer, breast cancer, uh, you know, or um, um, pancreatic cancer, diabetes, okay, as well as precocious puberty. So now we say that if the period start, or puberty starts before the age of nine, that's called precocious, sorry, eight, it used to be nine, so they've decreased eight, it's eight, that's called precocious puberty, okay? So you can't wait till they're teenagers. You have to prepare them for this much earlier, not only girls, also the boys. The other thing is early access to media and the use of media. Uh, because children out of ignorance, out of just testing this new technology, very often do very crazy things which gets them into trouble. So they need to be educated about media before you put a mobile phone or a laptop you know, in front of them. Right? And of course, every parent's nightmare, sexual abuse. And if you've been following this, you'll notice, what's the change in sexual abuse now? It's more visible. I mean, in the yes, you read, <coughs> absolutely, you read more about it. Yeah. What about the age? Yeah. Yes, younger and younger children are being targeted. And the reason for this is that because now it's very much part of sexuality education, you know, more and more parents and in schools, they're talking about good touch, bad touch, how to keep yourself safe. So children, older children who can speak are able to come and tell. So perpetrators are targeting younger children because then they're not going to tell. Also, people or children with special needs because many of them may be non-verbal or they may not have been educated because parents think, oh, they're so innocent. Why put these, you know, dirty ideas into their heads? Why ruin their innocence, which is complete hogwash. Okay, so the more we hide and the more we pretend that this is not something that children need to know about, we're actually putting our children at risk. So this is the argument I use. And if any of you are teachers or you talk to other parents, please use this argument that if you want to keep your child safe, the only way is to educate them, you know, and that like you won't teach, you won't say, okay, I, I'll only teach my 10 year old how not to play with matches, right? I'll only teach my five year old how to cross the road. No, when they're little babies, you're going to tell them about traffic and about getting burnt and so on. The same way with sexuality education. We have to 
talk to them so that uh, their safety is not compromised. Okay, so let's educate ourselves. I'll go in kind of preschool children, school age, and then the teenagers. Okay, so what are the characteristics of the preschool child? First of all, they are research scientists. They have intense curiosity about everything, whether it's an ant, you know, crawling on the ground, or it is why does the sky get dark before it starts to rain, or like why is, you know, mummy uh, different from daddy, okay, why does mummy sit when she pees, and why, does, why, can't, uh, why can't daddy stand? So they're intensely curious, so they notice differences. And at that age, because they don't have the awkwardness, and if there's a good relationship, they've not been shamed, uh, and you know, they, they feel comfortable about their bodies, they will ask questions about differences, okay? So that's, that's great. So we can, a preschool child is the easiest to teach about sexuality, actually, because, you know, they're, they're, they're like sponges, they soak everything uh, in. Uh, they love to use slang words, right? So, you know, you'll have children who, like, just think, uh, like, fart is such a funny word. They'll say fart and they'll be rolling all into like this, and it'll be the, like, the most hilarious thing that happened on earth, okay? And they love making, you know, little rhymes about, uh, like, even like dummy, mummy, okay? So uh, they, they use a lot of slang words and they look for the effect. Sometimes they hear maybe their parents using certain words or, you know, in, in the school or playground, and then they will come home and use it and see what, what the effect is gender identity develops by four years okay so um, there's the sex so male female or transgender and gender identity is a social construct okay it's true how you express your sexuality through your behaviors your activities or how do you feel inside your body do you feel more feminine masculine or a mix of both so it's not like two it's not binary it's more of a continuum and because um, sex differentiation, sex determination, gender identity is such a complex uh, biological phenomenon. There's so many things that need to work together, right? So, I mean, I, I'm not going to go in too much in detail, but maybe in the questions we can talk more about it because it's a fascinating way in which our gender and our um, sexual uh, differentiation occurs. But by four years, a boy or a girl, if they feel that a boy knows he's a boy and a girl knows he or she is a, a girl, okay? So that's, that happens by four years. Genital play is very, very common. Uh, and at this age, because they still don't know about what is private or not, it's quite often out in public, right? And we'll talk about uh, how we deal uh, with this. Uh, but it's very frequent at this age. So how do we start? We can talk about body science. Okay, if you're awkward, you don't want to use the word sexuality, that's absolutely fine. Okay, but we can talk about body science. And because they're scientists, they, they're happy to talk about body science. So talking about the body parts, that's the first thing. And this can be done even with, you know, two, three-month-old babies, right? And we teach them, this is your nose, this is your ear. But somehow when we go between the shoulders and the knees, we have all these funny, cute name like poo poo, pee pee, no no, nee nee, you know. So it's quite confusing for the child because what's a no no in one house is a pee pee in another house, right? So it's good to have a common vocabulary. Uh, and so please use scientific names for body parts. And I always tell parents, you know, it's hard to say penis. So a good way to practice is if you have a pet dog or a pet cat, just sit them in front of you and say penis. You know, if it's a male dog, say you have a penis. If it's a female cat, say you have a vulva. I don't know if cats have vulvas, but uh, I mean, <laughs> your cat won't turn and say, ah, what did you say? Okay, so, you know, just use these words frequently. Say them to yourself in front of the bathroom mirror. But with time, you know, you will get comfortable with using these words. The earth will not open and swallow you up. But use scientific names, okay? So, boys have penises. Yes. Yeah, please, please come. You can sit here also. Yeah, I'm not going to use. You can sit there. Squeeze together. Those who don't mind sitting in someone else's lap, please do that. Yeah. So now we will stop more people coming in today. Yeah. 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 Yeah
No problem. I'm more the merrier. I don't get disturbed, but. <laughs> I think Savita can sit in your lap and make yeah, this one. There's one seat here. There's also one more seat here. I have one. So, uh, okay. so uh, boys have penises, okay, and the scrotum, and girls have vulvas. Why don't I say vagina? Because actually, the vagina is not something that is immediately seen. The pubic area, that the perineal area, the name for that is vulva, and that's the scientific uh, term. So this reminds me of a little joke that I read in this wonderful book by Meg Hickling. So this preschooler had gone to preschool, and they had this uh, session on body parts. Okay, so she was bristling with this new knowledge and you know how preschoolers are they want to tell the whole world what they've learned so she went home and her, her, her grandmother was at, <coughs> excuse me at home so immediately she announced her grandma she says grandma do you know that we have a vulva so uh, really she said oh but we used to have a toyota <laughs> okay. right so body science and naming all the body parts Okay, the next concept that preschoolers need to learn is the concept of private. Okay, what is private? What is public? And uh, certain areas or certain themes. So parts of the body. Okay, what are the private parts of the body? The parts covered by your underwear. Okay, so those are the private parts of your body. What are private behaviors? Anything to do with your private parts? Personal hygiene, so like, um, you know, um, bathing, okay, washing yourself, things that happen with your private parts, okay, so that's, that's also a private uh, behavior. So if you need to, you know, go to the toilet, that's a private behavior. Private places in the bedroom or the bathroom with the door closed, okay, so if it's a public toilet, it's in the stall, that's a private place, not the, where the ba wash basins are, okay. What is, it's a house where there's no um, bedroom or, you know, under the sheets, okay? So with the blanket covering you, that, that could be maybe the only private place available to a child or an adult, okay? So, uh, so private places and then information. This too we need to tell children especially, that certain things we don't tell everybody, okay? So, you know, you won't give your phone number or, you know, the, your parents' credit card number or so certain, your wallet, that is private. Right, so there are many game-like ways in which we can, this can be done. So you have photographs of you know, different places, different activities, and then the child, you can ask children to sort them out into like a private uh, pile and a public or not private pile, okay? So this is the next concept that they need to learn. So parts of body and uh, what is private, public. Very important, we must teach children to wash themselves by the age of three years. Why do I say this? because they have to learn about personal boundaries. If a six-year-old is being washed after passing a stool, is being washed by someone else, then it's nothing odd for them, right? If someone touches their private parts, because they're used to someone else touching their private parts. Uh, and this, uh, you know, some time ago, there was this um, situation where the, a preschooler was being dropped, uh, you know, in an auto rickshaw to school, and she was the last child. So when everyone else had got off, she said that she wanted to pass urine. So there was an unfinished building, so the rickshaw driver took her there and said, you, uh, you know, uh, ease yourself here. And then he came with a bottle of water to wash her. And she allowed him to wash her, okay, because she didn't realize that it's something that's not to be done. So if a child has good boundaries, they will immediately feel uncomfortable with a behavior like this. We can put our hand over their hand and teach them, we can tell them what to do, okay, we can supervise it, but they have to learn to wash themselves. Okay, private touching. Okay, now this, as I said, is something that bothers parents a lot. Actually, masturbation is an extremely normal behavior. Even fetuses have been shown to masturbate. So very early children learn that different parts of our body give us different sensations. So just like we get a sensation by pulling our ear or by scratching our head, okay? The same way when we touch our private parts, we get a pleasurable sensation. And because kids are not socialized, they don't realize this is a private behavior when they're very young, they will do it in 
public. So all they ha we have to teach them is that it's a private behavior. Why? Because it's with your private parts. It is private touching. It should be done in a private place. Okay, so if your child is masturbating in front of the whole family uh, while you're watching TV, what will you do? You will not tell your child, you know, that's a sin, your you know, private part will fall off, or you will go blind, or you will go deaf. Most of us would wear glasses and wear hearing aids and continue to do even if it should happen, right? Uh, but this is a private behavior, so go to a private room, okay? So that, that's all that we need uh, to teach children about. Okay, the next thing is to use teachable moments. What are teachable moments? These are events or things that happen in our daily life. Because we can't seat our children like this and give them a lecture, right, about sexuality. So life happens and life has throws wonderful opportunities at us where we can teach children. For example, the incident I mentioned about the child masturbating in front of the family. That's a teachable moment. Or say a family member or a neighbor is having a baby. That's a teachable moment. Okay, so, or a um, uh, you know, newspaper clipping about, say, um, uh, um, gay pride parade. So that is a teachable moment. Okay, so um, teachable moments are really the way to do uh, childhood sexuality education. Of course, once they go to school, then they may be kind of, uh, they may have classes. But at home, it's more like a teachable <laughs> moment. Uh, there was this child who, you know, kind of his mother was waiting, had read up all the books and she had all the charts and everything ready. So one day, let's call him Rahul, Rahul came running in and says, Mommy, Mommy, where did I come from? So this is the moment she had been waiting for. She said, sit, sit, sit. And she took out all her teaching aids and she gave him this one hour lecture on, you know, uh, what happens and how the babies get in there, how they come out. And after some time, like he started falling asleep and he yawned and said, Oh, really? He said, because Pritam told me that she comes from Pune. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so, so what when a child asks a question? And I'm going to tell you a, a story about in my own personal life. So sometimes children ask questions like, where did I come from? Or, you know, why does uh, my penis uh, become big uh, when I want to make susu? Or, uh, you know, how's, why are these two dogs uh, one on top of the other, right? So what when a child asks a question? How do we deal with that? Not like this. <laughs> so that's the three-way approach. So always ask, what do you think? Because when children come with a question, they've already kind of thought about it. Quite, quite often, it does just pop into their head. So give them, like, it's interesting to know what they think, right? The next step. If they are misinformed, you can correct the misinformation and give the correct information. Okay. The third step is to give the family value. Right. So, for example, suppose your child uh, says, you know, um, where do babies come from? Okay. Say it's a three-year-old child. So you say, what do you think? So your child says, yeah, what big bird brings the baby and puts, keep, leaves it on the doorstep. So you can say, no, that's not correct. For a three-year-old, when mummies and daddies are ready to have a baby, okay, then they have babies. Okay, your three-year-old is not going to turn around, but you know how and so on. Okay, so but we are addressing the information. That's not a bird. It's mummies and daddies who make the babies, right? Then give the family value. Okay, we believe that mummies and daddies should have babies only when they are ready to look after the baby. They have enough money. They have enough, uh, you know, time and so on. Right? So that's your family value. If you don't know the answer, ask for time to think. Okay, don't hope that the child will forget the question and it will not come up again. So you can say, you know what, that's a really good question. Right? I want to make sure that I give you the right answer. So give me a day, let me find out and I will get back to you. Okay, and please go back and tell the child. So there was this family, they were sitting and had visitors over and they were, it was a dinner. And the little one girl pipes up and says, Daddy, where do babies come from? In the middle of this dinner party. So her father says, that's a very good question. I'll tell you at bedtime. No one wanted to go home then. You know, none of the guests, so everyone wanted to be there and see what was going to unfold. Use the library and other resources. I'm going to share some resources. There are loads of wonderful resources that we can, you know, make use of. Yeah? 
uh, but questions are great. If your kids are asking you questions, that's wonderful. Give yourself a big pat on the back for you know, <coughs> that kind of relationship that you have with your child that they, have, they come and ask you. Uh, OK, so this was a note that was found in the, um, I think this was uh, eight years old. What do you think? Good artist, no? <laughs> right, so what is the sexual development of a school age child? Okay, so we've spoken about preschoolers. School age children have a great growth in thinking. So now they like they think deeply about things, okay, they don't take everything at face value. Uh, they're still fairly concrete thinkers, can't do too much of abstract thinking. So when we speak to them, we have to kind of use real life examples to help them to understand. They're very interested in how the bodies work, almost like machines. You know, what are the parts of this body? Like, uh, if there's a baby, we say the stomach. So if it's in the stomach, then, you know, how does it get its food? Why don't we pull it out? Okay, so we must make sure we give them the correct kind of uh, architectural design and the function of each and every part, especially the internal parts. Hmm? They, they have a huge mechanical curiosity, a lot of sexual jokes. Again, for effect. Uh, I remember when I was a child, one of my favorite jokes, uh, to the dismay of my poor mother, uh, was about this Air India um, uh, flight. You know, there was this flight attendant who had served uh, sandwiches, and there was this passenger over there who enjoyed the sandwich very much. And then he called her and says, "Do pound ke beech mein kya hai?" Okay, and I thought this was the funniest joke on earth. So I was just wait for this moment and say, "I know a joke," you know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, then the need for privacy. And this is something we should always encourage. Because we've already spoken about private, but preschoolers sometimes still don't understand the concept for themselves. But this age, after six years, they're very conscious. So they'll wrap the towel around themselves, and they don't want anyone to see them if they're in public. Like, you know how we don't have public toilets. We have to go behind bushes. So, so this one's looking, that one's looking. Encourage that. So, OK, I'll make sure that it's private. Never pull down the towel of a child who's trying to uh, kind of uh, keep himself private, okay? So um, it's, it's a good concept because it gives them a sense of boundaries, right? Now, this need for privacy can sometimes can also go with disinhibition. So I remember this mother once coming and telling me, she was really worried. She said, no, my son, he'll come out with this towel and then he'll go into his room, take out his towel, and I found him he was holding his penis and pretending he was <laughs> playing the rock guitar. <laughs> I said, wonderful, maybe there'll be some, you know, new composition which comes out from there. <laughs> yeah, so there can be disinhibition with extreme inhibition. Okay, so what do we teach the school age child? As I said, the, whatever we've taught the preschooler plus reproduction. So they need to know how babies are born. And of course, you have to explain the whole, uh, you know, uh, all the uh, kind of mechanical things that happen. OK, so what are the body parts? So there's the penis, there's a the vagina, there are the ovaries, the testes. As I said, I won't have time to go into the detail. But reproduction can be explained very easily. Not only uh, kind of regular reproduction, but also now the new ways of reproduction. Because they're interested in things like test tube babies, surrogacy. And it's absolutely fine to explain these things to children. They'll be there in the newspapers, and they need to know. Also about homosexuality, right? You, we have to talk to them, giving them the value. What is homosexuality? When a boy loves a boy or a girl loves a girl, we call that homosexuality, as opposed to when a boy loves a girl or vice versa, that is heterosexuality. Okay, in our family, we believe that all people deserve equal respect. So um, they, they need to know about the different forms of reproduction also. Puberty, because very soon, some of them may have already started, uh, as we said now, eight, nine, uh, you know, children, especially girls, uh, puberty is starting. How do we know puberty is starting in our child? There will be a growth spurt. Very often girls will develop a breast bud. Okay, boys will develop um, um, hair. Okay, so um, uh, the, the secondary sexual characteristics. Okay, so the, you know, the, these are early signs. So if we haven't already spoken, definitely we should start talking to our children if we notice these signs. And of course, they're great books that we can share with kids because by now they know to read. And uh, I can assure you that will be the most read book in your house by that child. Internet safety, again, because by now they are already using, you know, technology. So again, this is a whole lecture by itself. 
setting up child, con you know, parent controls and blocking certain sites, all that has to happen because just by accident, you type the most innocent thing and, you know, all kinds of uh, content comes up, right? So, you know, you have to be, you have to train your child. Anything that they find is kind of beyond their knowledge or they should not be watching, they can come and ask questions, okay? They, they should exert that control for themselves. Okay, so 13 year old, what is to be done? Parent find this in the school bag of a 13 year old. Speak to the child. Right. Have a quick look yourself and, you know, <laughs> read through. The articles are good. That's what I've been told. <laughs> right. So now, sexual development of adolescents, this is generally the response you get. No, I like, <laughs> it's very hard to talk to an adolescent, especially if you haven't been talking before. It's even if you've been talking right from birth, it's still hard because adolescents are so kind of self-conscious, embarrassed. So a good place to talk is in the car while driving because you don't have to make eye contact. They can't jump out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they are captive for that amount of time. But many adolescents kind of uh, still ask questions, okay? So that's great. As I said, give yourself a pat on your back. There's a growth spurt. Now their bodies are changing. So that's a wonderful teachable moment to explain. Uh, they actively seek information. So therefore, the interest in pornography goes up a lot at this age. And many children get their information only from pornography. And you know there's a lot of uh, you know, wrong information there, especially in terms of body image and uh, you know, uh, the way people are pictured over there, how the female body is shown just as a commodity right, for male pleasure and so on. So we must talk about pornography and also talk about the dark side of pornography. Same sex groups, again, because of uh, kind of uh, they're in school or they're in boarding school or just in, you know, girls kind of hang out with girls and boys hang out with boys. So sometimes sexual exploration happens within same sex groups. It's not true homosexuality, it's just more of uh, kind of uh, learning more about yourself. So, you know, boys may have ejaculation contests, girls will compare, you know, whether they're wearing bra, what size, and so on, right? So, this is just part of that. Because in puberty, what happens? It doesn't happen at the same rate. So, that creates a lot of anxiety for children. Because you may have a girl who's already kind of, you know, obviously well developed, wearing a bra, and another one who's same age, completely flat chested. So, they tend to worry. Right? So it's important to tell them that you know puberty can start anywhere from, as I said, 8 or 9, right up to 16, 17. So there are many years for these changes to occur, and they don't happen at the same time. Then talking about relationships, again, you know, many uh, young people who are gay identify themselves at this time, because that's when the, there's kind of a burst of sexual development. Okay, so to talk to them that it's absolutely okay, they can, you know, if they're not comfortable talking to their parents first, at least to the school counselor or to any trusted uh, adult, because they may need help uh, kind of, uh, you know, with, with these kind of confusion of feelings. Right? Now, the media. Many people say, oh, the media is so bad and, you know, corrupting our children and all this. I think it's wonderful to discuss sexuality. Because whether it's songs, pop songs, or it is movies, you know, or newspaper, what comes in the newspaper or some TV program, it's full of sexual content, which can be used as a way to talk about uh, the, ch um, you know, sexuality to your child, okay? So, you know, again, when we're talking to teenagers, we have to present facts and the family value. Be ready for your family value to be rejected. That's absolutely fine. And you can see we can agree to disagree. <laughs> this is the reason why I have this family value. Yes, it may sound old fashioned, but I believe for this reason. And you believe for whatever reason. This is how your friends think. But it doesn't have to be only in sexuality. It could be, you know, about possessions, it could be about education, how we treat others, just generally in life. Teenagers are meant to reject and push their parents away, okay? So that's perfectly fine. They, but in their heads, they're absorbing what we are telling them. So some of the things we teach them, that sex is a choice, okay? And make a wise choice, um, you know, discuss refusal skills because they're still young to have sex if they're not yet adults. Uh, quickly, A, B, C, so A, abstinence, okay, 
masturbation is always there it's sex with someone you love to be be faithful so if you are going to have sex at least be monogamous right and c use a condom okay because safe sex and again masturbation is safe sex right can't get any infection uh, so a b c these are the things we have to tell our children and refusal skills what will you say if someone pushes you or someone has a tries to have a competition with you let's see you know what you can do you can say different uh, things that the child could say oh my parents will kill me or no i'm not into that kind of thing and so on okay so this has to be practiced before so that if they are in that situation they already know how they can be their own person rather than just uh, succumb to something which they're not really ready for must talk to them about contraception and sexually transmitted diseases uh, some of these uh, topics are a little difficult for parents so sometimes the school gets in like a doctor who can have a session uh, with the child but parents also need to know um, about at least something about contraception and uh, sexually transmitted diseases and of course internet safety all the more important in this age group because they have more freedom more access and poxo okay so the protection of children against sexual offenses which is a law now and very often it's children who get into trouble so you you have like a you know 17 year old and a 16 year old okay who are consenting to have sex with each other but the parents of the 17 year old usually the boy or, or rather parents of 16 year old usually the girl use the law to get the boy into trouble to keep the boy away from their daughter okay so this is something that we must tell teenagers about poxo that they can get into trouble with the law right so because it's 18 the, the age of consent is 18 okay they're trying to decrease it to 16 but uh, like it's in the uk and many other parts of the world but right now it is 18 and everything else there's nothing that you cannot talk to a teenager about okay everything under the sun can be spoken about a to z okay the last few uh, minutes i'd like to spend on uh, child sexual abuse uh, as I said, this is a harsh reality and younger and younger children are now being targeted. So it's very important to make sure that our children uh, are prepared. It's, I know it's very sad because in a way because you know you are kind of you're sometimes making them suspicious about people and uh, you know you also become kind of a bit um, awkward about this. But I think in the long run, children's safety comes first and there's no compromising on that right so how do we keep our child safe few messages first your body belongs to you you have this marvelous fantastic body that can do so many things this body belongs to you okay Two, trust your feelings they are usually right so i don't go so much by good touch bad touch because that's very hard for you know to for the child to distinguish but anything that makes you feel uncomfortable and all of us know what makes us feel uncomfortable right you have a right to say no so for example if you're traveling on a bus it's a very crowded bus bodies packed together right you know when someone is trying to make a pass right someone it could be a touch at the back of your calf which is you know not a private place at all but it's just makes you feel uncomfortable you have a right to turn around and say no and maybe that person whatever didn't like it was part of the thing but if if really they, it was just a harmless thing that person will move oh i'm so sorry right but if it's someone who was really trying to make a pass you'll see that you know they they, they were really trying to kind of uh, do something which is inappropriate right so anything that makes you feel uncomfortable so sometimes children don't like to be kissed They'll do like this after the and we'll, I love to kiss children, right? I mean, but no, I can't because it's, it's not right if the child doesn't like it. So they have a right to say no. Okay, whatever it is. They can always clarify it later on. If it is something, you know, grandma always gives me such tight hugs and all. I don't want to be hugged by her. And, you know, you have to deal with grandma now who's going to feel very bad because she just loves her grandchild so much, right? But we can talk about it that, you know, Put it not uh, your grandson or granddaughter doesn't love you but you know what he or she is just a little uncomfortable with touch even tight clothes they don't like to wear right? so put it in like a sensory thing rather than an emotional kind of uh, whatever rejection so the child has a right to say no 
and then role play what if situations. So anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. For example, if someone touches your private parts or asks you to touch their private parts or looks at your private parts or shows you their private parts or does anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. So you can list some common things or shows you pictures of people naked because many abusers, especially familiar uh, most abuse happens with familiar people in positions of trust. They will groom the child. They won't just abuse the child. So they'll start by playing little tickling games or showing them, uh, you know, pictures of uh, naked people. They're testing the waters, right? So anything that makes the child feel uncomfortable, if the child says no or comes and tells the parent at that point, something can be done, right? So without even touching, sexual abuse can start. So that's why good touch, bad touch is not such a great concept. So, and as I said, role play, what if situations. Hmm? Uh, so what if, what to do if abuse occurs? So three things, one is say no or stop and teach your child to say, it, it can't be no, no, like this. You don't have to be polite, be rude, but look the person in the eye and say no, stop. Okay, two, get away, move away from that place. So if it is, you know, in school, get out of the classroom. If it is at home, go to a neighbor. If it is in the tuition class, come home, wherever. Move out of that place. And third, go and tell someone. Right? So easy way to remember, no, go, tell. So just these three things. And role play, what if situations. Now, how, who are you going to tell? So what we do is take the child's handprint and on each finger, they have to write one person who they are going to tell. Okay, so you can see this child has really given it a lot of thought whether to tell Siddhartha or Suresh or Sumesh, and then he said, no, he'll tell his grandparent. <laughs> so so uh, for children with special needs, to make it simpler, three fingers, one person in the home, one person in school, one person in the community. So that these are the three places generally children are. Community would be a... Uh, you know, community worker like a police or a, a someone in a position of authority, right? Uh, at home, it could be any parent or other relative, and in school, whichever teacher or principal, whoever the child feels safe with. Hmm? But this, you, you, the child has already done this, so they're not confused. Many children succumb to sexual abuse and let it continue because they're confused. Nobody's spoken to them about it. The perpetrator says it's a sign of love. Okay, I'll give you presents. It's our little secret. And children love secrets, right? So they get confused and they allow it to continue. So if you've spoken to them before this happens, then they're much more likely to tell. Okay, some great resources that we can use. These two, there are many websites, okay? But these two are like the ones I often use. Seekers, which is a, a Sexuality Information and Education Council of the United States. Tarshi, which is from India, talking about reproductive and um, sexual health in India. Then the books, Tarshi has this whole set of books. Red and blue are for children. Uh, yellow is for parents. Orange is for teachers. Meg Hickling, any book by Meg Hickling, just buy it. It's just, their, her books are fabulous. One of them is more talking about sex, full of funny stories and drawings and so on. And for children, look what's happening to my body. There's a book for boys and a book for girls. I suggest you buy both, uh, regardless of the gender of your child. And my last slide. So T is for tights and T is also for thanks. So thank you so much. And uh, as I said, do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks a lot. And any questions?